Please welcome President Barbara R. Snyder. Good evening. I'm delighted to welcome you to the sixth annual celebration of the Inamori Ethics Prize presented by the Inamori International Center for Ethics and Excellence at Case Western Reserve University. I must start by recognizing our talented musicians from El Sistema, an after-school orchestral music program at the Rainey Institute in Cleveland. Cleveland's El Sistema is one of seven such programs nationwide, and we are thrilled that they could join us today. Please join me in thanking them for their beautiful performance. I also want to take a moment to thank our title sponsor for tonight's celebration. The Callahan Foundation was founded by F. Joseph Callahan and his wife, Mary Elizabeth, to support worthy nonprofits, primarily in Northeast Ohio. Mary Ellen died in 1992, and in June of this year, Joe Callahan passed away at age 89. Joe was a legendary business leader and philanthropist, and our F. Joseph Callahan Distinguished Lecture celebrates his legacy. The Callahan Foundation is led by his son, Tim Callahan, who is vice chair of the university's board of trustees. I am so grateful for the foundation's support and for Tim's tireless engagement. I also want to thank our other sponsors, friends, and partners whose names are listed in your program. The support of these institutions and individuals makes tonight's event possible. Senator Sherrod Brown, Congresswoman Marsha Fudge, and Cleveland Mayor Frank Jackson sent proclamations or letters congratulating the recipient of the Inamori Ethics Prize. These documents are on display on the box level of Severance Hall. As you exit, I invite you to take a moment to read these wonderful words of support. I also invite you to enjoy the Inamori Center's second annual issue of the International Journal of Ethical Leadership, which is available at Amazon.com. Inside this issue, you will find pieces written by Inamori Ethics Prize winners, transcripts from last year's prize events, and articles by top international scholars on vital topics related to ethical leadership. It is indeed a subject worthy of thorough examination and contemplation. Dr. Kazuo Inamori, the namesake of the Inamori Ethics Prize, explains that whether for good or evil, the actions, attitude, and stance of a leader are not limited to that individual alone. They spread like wildfire throughout the entire group. The group is a mirror reflecting the leader. It is in that spirit that we gather as a community each September to celebrate exemplary ethical leaders whose actions improve the human condition. Dr. Inamori is an entrepreneur, corporate turnaround expert, revered philanthropist, Buddhist priest, and creator of the Kyoto Prize. He lives by two important principles. First, that people have no higher calling than to serve the greater good of humankind and society. And second, that the future of humanity can be assured only through the balance of scientific progress and spiritual maturity. It is so fitting that our award for ethical leadership and our academic center devoted to ethics both bear his name. Dr. Inamori could not join us today but I do want to recognize Mr. Toyomi Inamori, Senior Managing Director of the Inamori Foundation and President of KI Enterprise Company Limited and his colleagues from the Inamori Foundation who have joined us from Japan. Toyomi-san. Thank you for traveling such a great distance to attend today's celebration. This year, we are pleased to host our first business leader to receive the Inamori Ethics Prize, successful entrepreneur and avid environmentalist, Ivan Chouinard, or as he will tell you, his real name is Ivan Chouinard. Did I get that right? <laughs> Close. <laughs> you are going to meet him in a few minutes. He has long proven that business success and sustainability are not mutually exclusive. 
the chair of Case Western Reserve's Board of Trustees embraces this principle as well. And I would like to invite Chuck Fowler to the stage for a special announcement. Chuck and his wife, Shar created the Fowler Center for Sustainable Value at the Weatherhead School of Management, where business leaders discover how environmental, environmental sustainability and profits can coexist. Today, I am proud to announce that they have pledged $6 million to create a fellowship program at the Fowler Center for Sustainable Value. The new Fowler Family Fellowships will help the Weatherhead School attract exceptional students and ease these students' financial challenges so that they can focus instead on transformational ideas and business practices. These Fowler Fellows will be trained as outstanding leaders for the advancement of business and society. They will also serve as catalysts for collaboration across our campus. Chuck, I ask you to say a few words about your remarkable gift. Thank you, Barbara, and thank you all for being here, and thank you for that great reception. We are extremely proud, Char and I and our family, to be able to put together this opportunity to help educate and help our future business leaders understand the value and the desire for sustainable value and training in their organizations. We established the Center for Sustainable Value some years ago, and a number of volunteer fellows have really done a yeoman's work in documenting stories and documenting what businesses are doing around the world to do good and do well. But we've determined that there was a greater need for more and more of those stories and more and more of those documentation so that we can do a better job of spreading the word around the world of helping other businesses around the country and around the world. So we're establishing a scholarship and endowing that scholarship that will uh, bring two MBA students per year. So each year there'll be four uh, working at the Fowler Center along with their studies. So they have to do a little work, you know, it, this is not free. And to be able to put together the stories that are around the world that need to be told and need to be taught to our upcoming entrepreneurs. And it really to focus that scholarship and will be focused on uh, US MBA students. We want to ensure the center has a sustainable value and it will flourish and help in our efforts to make business as an agent for world benefit. Thank you all and thank you all for coming. Thank you, Chuck and Char, Shannon and Ed, Holly and Rob. We are delighted you all can be here this evening to celebrate with us. The university's Board of Trustees shares our enthusiasm for the Inamori Ethics Prize, and many of them are with us this evening. Our board members volunteer their time and talents, and the university and its students benefit in myriad ways from their engagement. We are joined tonight by university trustees, Tim Callahan and his wife, Nancy, Joe Keithley and his wife, Nancy, Frank Linsalata and his wife, Jocelyn, and trustee emerita, Lainey Haddon. Please stand and let us thank you. And now I am pleased to introduce Dr. Shannon French, the Inamori Professor in Ethics and Director of the Inamori International Center for Ethics and Excellence at Case Western Reserve University. Shannon. Thank you, President Snyder. The mission of the Inamori International Center for Ethics and Excellence, established through the vision and generosity of Dr. Kazuo Inamori and the Inamori Foundation, 
is to explore the nature of ethical leadership and encourage individuals in every field of human endeavor to embrace their ethical obligations, aspire to be responsible local and global citizens, carve out new opportunities for people to live meaningful lives and defend those that are threatened, and make enduring contributions to the common good. To fulfill this mission, we teach and train, we develop programs, events, and outreach initiatives, we fund experiential and service learning projects, we support scholarship and research initiatives designed to promote productive engagement with today's most important ethical issues. In this effort, we are privileged to be able to collaborate with many wonderful partners and change agents on our campus, in our community, across the country, and around the world. We are especially grateful for the opportunity to work with students, whether they be K through 12, undergraduates, graduates, or professional students, or lifelong learners. They're all striving to be global ethical leaders. I think we're supposed to be inspiring them, but they are the ones who inspire us. As you heard, this year marks the sixth presentation of the Inamori Ethics Prize. Each September, when we gather here in Severance Hall, our aim is to put before you an example of an authentic ethical leader who's made a lasting positive contribution to the world. It's no accident that although our prize recipients come from many different backgrounds, work in many different fields, they all share key qualities and core beliefs such as integrity, moral courage, deep concern and respect for others, an interest in justice, and the conviction that whatever roles you take on, you should, as Dr. Inamori advises, strive with every decision to do the right thing as a human being. Since Cleveland is the proud home of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, you will allow me now to quote Janis Joplin who said quite wisely, don't compromise yourself, you are all you've got. All of our prize recipients have refused to compromise their values for fleeting gains, such as profit or fame, recognizing that while it might be possible in the short term to do well without doing good, material success is empty without contributing to something greater than yourself. We are truly honored to be able to bring these inspirational individuals here to share their insights and experiences with us. Now please join me in welcoming Provost and Executive Vice President Bud Baselick to tell you more about this year's outstanding Inamori Ethics Prize honoree, Yvonne Chouinard. Thank you, Shannon. Case Western Reserve understands that one of our core responsibilities is to graduate individuals whose definition of success demands that their achievements also benefit others. Our 2013 Inamori Ethics Prize honoree, Mr. Yvonne Chouinard, has called himself a reluctant businessman because he never defined success in terms of making a profit. The kinds of successes that interested him were safe ascents of Mount Everest or a good catch from a peaceful day of fly fishing. And when life conspired to make Mr. Chouinard a corporate leader, he turned his attention to promoting the success of his employees and doing what he could to ensure that the success of his company did not come at the expense of the planet. Yvonne Chouinard began making reusable climbing hardware for a very simple reason. He needed equipment for his own climbing. In 1957, he went to a junkyard for supplies, taught himself blacksmithing, and eventually started his first entrepreneurial venture producing climbing gear. Schnard became an outspoken advocate of the importance of the style and intention behind an ascent, which has become the basis of modern rock climbing. In 1974, he penned an essay with his then business partner, Tom Frost, in which they present a challenge. As we enter this new era of mountaineering, re-examine your motives for climbing. Employ restraint and good judgment. Remember the rock, the other climbers, climb clean. This philosophy is the foundation of Schnard's subsequent leadership. Schnard is most noted for creating the outdoor clothing and gear company Patagonia Incorporated with the goal to create the best 
quality with the least impact. After discovering that the production of standard cotton has a terrible environmental impact, Chouinard committed Patagonia to the use of pesticide-free cotton, which led to the creation of the organic cotton industry in California. Patagonia continues to lead the way in recycled fabric research and has joined with other major corporations to, to spur further development of sustainable and lower impact products and materials. Recognizing that the financial success of a company creates an opportunity for employees to achieve their personal goals, Chouinard committed Patagonia to fostering employee wellness and being an outstanding place to work. The cafeteria at Patagonia headquarters serves mostly healthy vegetarian fare. The company also provides on-site daycare and flexible schedules for employees. Chouinard's 2005 book, Let My People Go Surfing, explores the unique corporate climate at Patagonia. Reflecting his own love of the natural world, Chouinard offers financial incentives for Patagonia employees to work on local environmental projects. In 1985, he instituted the Earth Tax, through which Patagonia has committed 1% of sales to grassroots environmental organizations, totaling millions of dollars. Chouinard went on to co-found 1% for the Planet, an organization through which other companies can make their own environmental donations. That group now boasts over 170 member companies. In 1994, Patagonia began hosting Tools for Grassroots Activist Conferences, at which experienced activists train leaders in environmental groups they support through their grants. In 2005, Chenard's Patagonia built its own power plant out of solar panels that cover the parking lots and provide 10% of the power for the company headquarters in Ventura, California. Yvonne Chenard began a company while also inspiring a movement. Business journalist Crystal Lutz recently described Schnard as the pioneer in corporate social responsibility. And distinguished journalist and author Tom Brokaw said to Von Schnard, he walks the walk more than anyone else I know in American business. We are proud to have the opportunity to share Yvonne Schnard's story and honor him with the 2013 Inamori Ethics Prize for his outstanding ethical leadership in the field of business. Yvon Chouinard, throughout your career, you have consistently demonstrated the importance of ethical leadership through your dedication to the principles of corporate social responsibility and in promoting the well-being of your employees at Patagonia Incorporated. By holding fast to your principles, putting people in the planet first, and making hard choices, you have inspired others to examine and reshape their own impact on the world. Your work perfectly reflects the spirit and mission of the Inamori International Center for Ethics and Excellence. On the recommendation of the Inamori Ethics Prize Selection Committee, it is my pleasure to present to you the 2013 Inamori Ethics Prize Medal. Well, um, on behalf of my partner and wife, uh, Melinda, and the 1,500 employees of Patagonia, I gratefully accept this award. Um, I gave a talk at Ryman Auditorium at Great Old, Grand Ole Opry one time, and it was nowhere near as elegant as this. <laughs> um, I'm going to try to take you through a little odyssey of where Patagonia has been and where it's going in the future. I was making clothes for about 20 years before I really learned how to make clothing. And it started one day when we opened a store in Boston and we put in all the clothing in the springtime and a lot of it was sportswear. And within three days, the employees were complaining they were getting headaches. And so we closed the store down, brought in a chemical engineer. He said, oh, just you, you're poisoning your employees. <laughs> he says, the problem is your ventilation system is recycling the same air. And uh, I said, well, OK. If I was a normal businessman, I'd say, 
don't tell me about the poison, just fix the ventilation system. But I said, well, what's the poison? He said, well, it's formaldehyde. And it's all on all your cotton clothing. I said, what? Said, yeah, it says, you're, uh, all your stay press, wrinkle-free um, cotton clothes have got this chemical on it called formaldehyde. And it's, you know, in biology class, it's what, you got dead lizards in there, preserved and stuff. I said, oh my God, I had no idea. And that's when I realized I had no idea how to make clothing. All I did was call a fabric supplier. He'd come by with books on fabrics, and I'd say, oh, I like this shirting. Give me 10,000 yards of that. Never questioning what went into making that product. And, you know, formaldehyde, I found out, is one of the 80,000 chemicals used in America, of which only 300 have been tested to see whether they're toxic or not. And this one, finally, last year, the FDA admitted that it causes cancer. Um, and it's still being used in hair salons to straighten the hair. So I thought, you know, <laughs> I don't want to be in business if I, I'm doing stuff like this. And so that led us to ask a lot of questions. And we questioned, well, you know, what fibers are safe to use? And, uh, you know, what are we doing? And so we started educating ourselves. And we found out that industrially grown cotton is probably the worst product to be making clothing out of. Because it uses 25 or 23 percent of the world's pesticides, even though it occupies only 3 percent of the world's farmland. It uses uh, chemicals similar to Agent Orange that we sprayed on Vietnam in order to defoliate the plant. It, I mean, the story goes on and on and on how bad it is. And, and so I took uh, all our employees, every single one, and we went to Central Valley in California where they grow a lot of this stuff. And it was a dead zone. And in fact, we got sp sprayed by crop dusters. Uh, there was nothing alive there. And I thought, oh my God, you know, I don't want to ever make another cotton product if we have to do this. And thankfully, there was an alternative, although it didn't exist at the time, which was organically grown cotton. So we had to convince farmers to grow it. In some cases, we had to co-sign their bank loans because the chemical companies and the banks, you know, they wouldn't give them loans. Um, if they grew organically. And so anyway, we had to start this whole thing out. And that, you know, one question led to another question. Well, how about dyes? Are dyes toxic? We didn't know. We just bought dyed goods. So then we had to find out whether dyes are toxic. There's polyester dyes, there's nylon dyes, there's cotton dyes. Some are toxic, some aren't. And so, you know, by educating ourselves, we were able to make more responsible decisions. And, you know, in some cases, we were using non-toxic dyes, but some colors were still toxic. So we didn't use those colors. And, you know, this whole examination of our supply chain has gone on for years and years. You can look it up on our website. Uh, and it'll give you a good idea how far we've gone with that. It goes all the way to you know, calculating how much water is used to make a t-shirt. I forgot the number, but it's astronomical. And water isn't just water. You got to keep digging deeper because, you know, it makes a difference whether that cotton was grown in an area that has rainfall or an area, a very desert area where they dammed up some rivers and irrigate or an area that they pump water out of fossil water that's millions of years old that never be replenished. And so, you know, by educating yourself, you're left with, um, with information that you can use. And that's what we've been doing. We pretty much cleaned up as much of our supply chain as we possibly can now. 
um, except we still are buying, you know, uh, supplies from gigantic fiber companies and things like that, of which we can't really change their behavior. We're way too small. But we are trying to get together with other like-minded companies to change the way they do business. But we still have a long ways to go with that. So, uh, you know, our mission statement is to make the best product, cause no unnecessary harm, and we're well on our way to, to doing the best we can there. The third part of our mission statement is to use business to inspire and implement solutions to the environmental crisis. Well, we discovered that we can't save this planet by ourselves. And so we sort of came out of the closet and we started talking about the things that we're doing so that we could influence other companies. And as it turns out, we have. Um, my book, Let My People Go Surfing, has now been published in 20 languages, including Bulgarian, in case of you, <laughs> some Bulgarians out there. <laughs> the latest one is Russian. And so it's, it's really influenced a lot of companies. And to the point where uh, my friend Rick Ridgway, who's head of our environmental uh, department, was at a big conference of Fortune 500 companies. I mean, these are the Unilevers, these are the largest companies in the world. And there were all the uh, environmental directors, sustainability, so-called sustainability directors of these companies, all talking about how they're greening their supply chain, how they're doing all these fantastic things to make their companies more responsible. And it sounded great, except my friend leaned over to the guy from Google and said, hey, if, if all of these companies are doing all this great stuff, how come we're still destroying the planet? And the guy from Google said, it's growth. It's the elephant in the room that nobody wants to talk about. So I just read a book about energy, uh, written by an Englishman. He was talking about the energy use in England. And he said, OK, you guys, you want to you wanna substitute fossil fuel with all green energy. Here's what that means. OK, we'll take 10% of England, and we'll put in wind turbines. We'll take 20% of the total country, and we'll put in solar panels. We'll take 5,000 kilometers of the coastline, and we're going to put in tidal power and, and wave power, and we're going to dam every river, and we'll have hydropower, and we're going to put in you know, nuclear reactors. At the end, you know, there'll har hardly be room for people. We still won't be able to replace fossil fuels. So what does that mean? just continue with fossil fuels? For me, it means we got to use less. And, you know, if, if we're using up the resources of one and a half planets right now, worldwide, Americans, by the way, are using up like seven times. And by 2050, when my granddaughter is going to be 30 years old, no, yeah, 35 or something, whatever the math is, I'm not very good at math. <laughs> we'll be using up the resources of between three and a half and five planets. I just got the latest World Watch Institute book, which keeps track of where we are in this world right now. And they said, we're on track to have a temperature rise of four degrees Celsius by the end of the century, which is complete disaster for not only nature, but humankind. If we started today, and they say, and that book was published a while ago, there's a slim chance we could keep it down to two degrees Celsius. And th this is grim stuff, really grim. And um, 
So we started a dialogue within our catalogs of what would an economy look like that doesn't destroy the planet? And we're asking some smart people to write essays and stuff. And uh, I can't help but think that it starts with a few words. One is simplicity. One is responsibility. One is restraint. One is uh, uh, better technology. I, I know of a company that's the most sustainable I ever heard of. It's a little company in Japan that sells plums. You know, the Japanese eat a lot of pickled plums and plums in every conceivable way. And this little shop only sells plums. And they don't do mail order. They don't do internet sales. And they probably, even when you buy something, they probably total it up on an abacus, <laughs> which, is, which is a really cool calculator. But you know what? They've been in business for 700 years. That is sustainability. And so I, I thought, well, our next stage of our company is we have to do something about this endless consuming and discarding that's really destroying the planet. So we have to engage our own customers into thinking twice of whether they need to buy Patagonia or not. In fact, we came out with some ads in the New York Times on Black Friday that said, don't buy this jacket unless you need it. Think twice. And if you do buy it, uh, thank you for buying from us than from somebody else. And here's what we promise. We promise that if it breaks, we'll repair it. If you outgrow it, you get tired of the color or, or your kid, you know, is, uh, is outgrown it or whatever, you've gotten too fat, <laughs> we'll help you sell it to somebody else. And when it's finally um, completely worn out and you can't do anything with it, give it back to us and we'll recycle it into more clothing. So it forces my company to make things out of fibers that can be recycled. It forces us to make a zipper on a polyester jacket that's a polyester zipper so that the whole thing can be recycled. And also, I don't want to see this stuff coming back. <laughs> so it forces us to make the, our clothing so it doesn't wear out. And in fact, what's pretty cool, uh, I live in Jackson Hole in the summer, and uh, these teenage kids are saying, you know, the coolest thing in school right now is to wear your old, your parents' old, old Patagonia stuff. The older, the cooler it is. And that's what I want to see. I don't want to see this stuff end up in the junkyard and Salvation Army store. I want to see it worn. And we're going to help you... Uh, in repairing your product, we're, we're coming out with a sewing kit. Um, it's a, just a little sewing kit you can take with you, and it has an awl that you can even sew through leather with, and instructions on how to sew buttons and how to use it. We're going to be producing videos on how to repair your own stuff. And we're going to help you to, you know, kind of be better consumers. I want to do an ad that shows a model with a pair of brand new distressed jeans with holes all over them and a slash mark, slash marks on the photograph. And then next to it is a model with a pair of jeans with patches all over it. You know, the... Um, This consumer society uh, is, is what the problem is. And that's who we are. 
You know, we're, no, we're not citizens anymore, we're consumers. The stock market goes up and down according to our level of confidence. All the economic indicators are based on us consuming. Remember after 911, W came out and said, get out there and shop. You gotta help the economy. Um, that's wrong. We used to say in the, in the 70s, he who dies with the most toys wins. Not. Um, Thoreau said, the more you know, the less you need. And that's kind of the, you know, definition of consumer is, is he who uses up, who destroys. And that's what we are. We're, we can talk about ethical corporations all day long, or non-ethical. Corporations make what we tell them to make. We're, we're the start of all of this. And I can tell you that uh, are we going to have a, if we have to go back to living in a house of 950 square feet, like we, like houses, the average house was in the 50s. Is that going to be a horrible lifestyle? I mean, I, I was raised in a house of that size, family of six. What I did is I went out and my, me and my father uh, converted the chicken coop <laughs> into a bedroom. I had a straw mattress, and that's where I lived. And it was the coolest place for a teenager to live you can imagine. Um, I know in sport, when you get really good at your sport, you simplify everything. And you know the climbs I did on El Capitan that took 10 days are now being soloed by guys in their high school gym shorts, and they're back before lunch. That, that's the way sports should go, not more and more technology. I mean, look at the hunter. He wants to shoot a deer. He buys a high-powered rifle with a big telescope on it and an ATV, and he cruises the back roads until he sees a deer, lays the gun on the handlebars, and shoots the deer from 300 yards away. Big deal. And then he graduates to, he gets a compound bow. And he goes and shoots his deer. And then he goes even further, and he makes his own bow out of wood and naps his own flint arrowheads. And, and I even know a guy who spears an elk every year. Just like our caveman ancestors. He dresses himself up like an elk, walks into a herd, <laughs> <laughs> and pokes it. <laughs> So, I mean, my message is, I don't, think, I don't think we have to have an impoverished society because we simplify our lives. You know, I, I need somebody to, I mean, I, don't, I just don't have the courage, I don't have the gumption to quit flying. I don't, I don't have, I need somebody to tell me, no, you can't go to Russia next year to go fly fishing. You got to stay home. That's, that's what has to happen. Uh, you know, we, we can't all sit down and belly up to a 16-ounce T-bone anymore. And is that going to be an impoverished life? I don't think so. There was a professor at University of Montana, Professor Powers, who wrote a book, and he said, we only need to spend 10% on food to be healthy. We only need to spend 10% on clothing to be well-dressed. 10% on your house. I mean, we're, we're so over the top in excess. I mean, I was using an example this afternoon of a banana cutter, which is, you know, one of those things you can get in Sky Mall magazine. <laughs> you know, it's, it's a little thing that has wires and you lay a banana on there and you do this and it cuts it in perfect 
Well, it replaces a perfectly adequate tool called a knife. <laughs> but don't stop there. Eliminate the knife. Just eat the banana. <laughs> I think, uh, you know, we, we all know that government has to do a lot more. Government is, you know, they're probably going to OK the Keystone Pipeline. You know, world's dirtiest oil, world's biggest environmental disaster, and we're going to run it through arbor refineries in Louisiana. And, you know, we should just leave that stuff in the ground. We shouldn't be part of that. If you own stock... If you own stock in General Electric, guess what? Your, your company, your company, you're an owner, didn't pay any taxes last year. If you own stock in a tobacco company, you're guilty. You're killing people with your product. In fact, you're saying on your package it's going to kill you. So if, if we want to have, right now we have the government we deserve. If we want to have the government that we really need, we're going to have to change the corporations. Because the government is just a pawn of the corporations. <laughs> but you know what the Zen master would say? Don't focus on changing the government. Don't focus on changing corporations. Focus on changing ourselves. We're the, we're the addicts. We're addicted to consuming. And until we can get up and admit that, oh my god, I am the problem, nothing happens. And you know, after, after uh, Inconvenient Truth came out, I asked my close environmentalist friends, what did you think of that? Oh my god, that was such a heavy film. Oh, I had no idea, you know how far along we are with this global warming. And I said, well, did you change your light bulbs? Uh, no. Until we can point at ourselves and say, I am an addict, we're not going to change. And if we, if we can change ourselves, corporations will change, and so will government will follow. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chouinard. We are honored to have you join us on our campus as we recognize your ethical leadership. Your pioneering work challenges and inspires us. At this time, I'm pleased to welcome the members of Dama Capella, our award-winning international a cappella performance group, to present a closing selection for our ceremony this evening. <laughs> Darling, don't be afraid. I have loved you for a thousand. 